is there any research out there with um, animal-based diets in terms of infertility? Well, nothing formal with animal-based diets, but certainly with meat and organs, I think you can you can see a pretty clear correlation in the research between the consumption of animal foods and fertility. That's that's known, and we can see throughout the literature most of it's observational because these are hard studies to do in terms of randomized and controlled studies that are actually interventional. But in, there's lots of observational epidemiology to suggest that overall human health is better with animal foods, that, that people are taller, which is an indication of overall health, that lifespan is better with animal foods. Yes. And you know, there's a correlation there with the financial uh, status of a country as well. But in, in countries that have better uh, economies, people generally eat more animal foods uh, in, in tandem. So it's pretty clear, I think, that animal foods result in better nutrition for humans. It's it's really strange to me that in the United States and parts of the Western world, it's very in vogue um, and perhaps increasingly or sadly, increasingly politically correct to shun animal foods when most mm-hmm. of the developing world knows without a doubt that um, things like beans or grains or leafy greens are just survival food. And they're not ideal for humans. Yeah. They're not ideal for they're men. They're fillers. Yeah, they're fillers. They're not ideal for men or women. They're certainly not ideal for women that want to conceive. And they're not ideal in pregnancy. And there's all sorts of reports in the literature that never get talked about by plant-based news sources of all kinds of nutritional deficiencies in the developing wor- world related to overconsumption of things like cassava, which is a root that has many anti-nutrients, cyanogenic glycosides, isothiocyanates, et cetera, and, and grains. And, and just it's it's prevalent and it's it's just pervasive. And I had Diana Rogers on the podcast a few months ago, and she said something that I thought was quite striking that throughout the world, and this is a bit of a digression, so we won't go too far down the rabbit hole, but throughout the developing world, people are starving, but there's not really a calorie deficiency. We have enough calories to feed people in the world, but we don't have our enough nutrients. <laughs> Nutrients, and we have, yeah. we don't have enough minerals and vitamins and we, we can try and fake it with vitamin and mineral supplements, but that doesn't work as well as real food because we often can't fake things that we don't know exist. This is what's so interesting to me about animal foods, meat and organs in particular is that there are nutrients in liver and heart and spleen and pancreas and kidney and, you know, intestines and brain and testicle that we don't even know about as humans that, that mm-hmm. people just have always eaten intuitively because they were looking mm-hmm. to honor, honor the whole animal and didn't want to waste anything calorically. And so there's all these nutrients that we don't even know about, whether they're peptides or you know precursor molecules or hormones or hormone precursors that are valuable for humans that we cannot ever synthesize. We can't recreate in a multivitamin. We can't recreate in a synthetic prenatal multivitamin, which we should have no. mentioned earlier has usually folic acid in it rather than folate. Mm-hmm. Which is a huge problem. Yeah, there's a real interesting thing here about this. This is a really important thing that we should touch on in this podcast. The idea that there there is research to suggest that, well, number one, folic acid does not occur in nature. It's it's a synthetic form of folate. It doesn't occur anywhere. So there's no requirement for folic acid in the human body, but all the supplements contain folic acid probably because it's the most stable form. But in the human body, there's you know, L5-methylfolate, there's 5-10-methyltetrahydrofolate, there's tetrahydrofolate, there's all sorts of forms of folate that are actually biologically identical. And if those occur in your prenatal, then you have a prenatal that's better than one with folic acid. But there's this potential that a prenatal containing folic acid might even do negative things in some people. I don't know if we have enough research to say that with full confidence, but I would never take folic acid. And I imagine that you recommend against folic acid to your clients as well. A hundred percent. That's the first thing I ask somebody when they come in, like, what are you taking? And I, I start by saying that I would like to see them before they get pregnant. So they know not to take this anyways, but if they're coming in and I haven't met them yet, like if they're taking any supplement that contains folic acid, I tell them to get off it immediately. And most of the time they're like, oh, what do you mean? I'm supposed to take folic acid. I'm being a good mom. And, and you're like, yes, but that's not what we want you on. So it's, it's, we know nowadays that it's harmful. Like it's not, it's not what we want to use for, you know, pregnant women. And it's just given out like candy, you know, like you go to any store and that's prenatal and it's folic acid, folic acid, folic acid, you know, doctor after doctor, folic acid. It's, and it's, it's, it's very harmful, especially if you haven't been tested for MTHFR and then it's just completely wreaking havoc on your system. 